Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. The fool, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Please be seated. Good morning. If uh, you are visiting with us and you've gotten one of those attendance packets there, inside of that should have been an attendance card. If you'll pass that toward one of the aisles at this time, we've got some gentlemen who will come down and pick those things up. We'd like to have a record of your attendance, and we are extremely grateful that you are here with us today. We're thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to come together as a family of God and to worship our God together. Now, I'm going to be just as honest with you as I can. I don't know how many years of our marriage that uh, Brandy and I have spent at a baseball and or softball park. I don't know how many games I've watched. I don't know how much time, I guess, would be not technically wasted, but recre uh, recreational time there. And I still have no idea how a person would get a slugging percentage or what that means. I know when you look at it on the box score, you go, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. I don't know what that means. I just look at it and understand that that's a, that's a, a good thing. You know, many people who we walk by and who we talk to every day would say the same thing about God. They, they, they know the Word. And even if you were to say, who is God to them, and they were to say, the God of the Bible, you could come back with, well, which one? More than 2,000 were found in Egypt. Babylon had one for every day of the week. You could talk about Molech. You could talk about Dagon. You could talk about Baal. Who, which one? Which God? Oh, you know, the God of the Bible. Well, they're all in there. Who is the real God? Over the next few weeks, what we want to study here is who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? And here's the kicker. I want you to mark on your calendar the night that will be three weeks from now. Because that one's going to be how they all work together. So don't miss out. When you and I look at the question, who is God? We got to ask which one as we start out. Well, we want to look at the God of the Bible. Well, once again, there are plenty of those. Let's look at the God who wrote the Bible. Let's look at the God who created all of those things, the one that we serve from the Bible, the one that's found mentioned twice in three verses at the very outset of the uh, book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you'll read that the, earth, the, the Spirit moved across the face of the earth. And God said, right there within those few words, you have God mentioned in, in his three parts twice. Matter of fact, the very first word in the beginning, God, be the third word in the Hebrew language, the fourth word in the English language. That word Elohim, H-I-M, as you study through those Hebrew words, is a pluralized word, yes, but it's not just a pluralized word. The H-I-M deals with a plural of three. That's all it ever deals with, a plural of three. Imagine that. He mentions God himself there. And then he mentions the Spirit individually. He mentions God the Father individually. And then he mentions that God said that, that one who will become, according to John 14, or 1 in verse number 14, the one that will become Jesus the Christ. You want to see who is God? 
Let him speak for himself. When, when God speaks of himself, he speaks of himself as being great, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and being good, loving, being holy, being perfect, being merciful, being invisible, glorious, just, gracious, righteous. Are y'all writing all those down? If you're missing them, we'll, we'll have them going somewhere, I'm sure. Long-suffering, majestic, generous, compassionate, kind, wealthy, faithful. What God are you looking for? This is all of him. The creator, the sustainer, the giver of freedom, the provider, the sustainer, eternal. Notice these words from the book of uh, the, the uh, Psalms. A fortress, a buckler, a hope, a shield, a redeemer, the authority, the shelter, the control. He's our need. Everything that you can think about God is something that you and I need. He's the creator. Why? Because, well, we, how many of you would like to be here? I mean, on this, on this planet, right? Yeah. Oh, he doesn't create that. He doesn't create you and me. Where do we go? How do we get here? He gives us a freedom like, like we would never even know and understand. Can you imagine the freedoms that we have as a country as compared to the world? Now, compare that as the freedoms of the child of God versus the child of rebellion. We find ourselves seeing him as the eternal one, the fortress, the one who, who protects us, the buckler, the shield, the hope. This is our God. This is the one we have opportunity to come together every week and worship this is the one who has given us, given us the ability as his children to stand before his very throne. And not only just stand there, but we also have the ability to pour out of ourself all of our worries and distress, all of our cares, all of our concerns, all of our hopes and wishes and needs. And he listens to all of those. And he takes all of those into consideration. This is the God that writes the Bible. This is not just any God of the Bible. This is not just any God found around. This is the God. His name, his name Y-H-W-H, anglicized from the Hebrew, is what's known as the Tetragrammaton. Uh, you can pronounce it Yahweh or Yahweh or however you think maybe the uh, vowels go in there. His formalized name means I am that I am. You remember that in Exodus chapter 3? where Moses would say, who am I supposed to say sent me? And he said, you say the I am sent you. The I am what? I am the bread of life? Sure is. I am the one to supply his needs? Sure is. The I am, that one, the, the one who supplies everything that we need. Genesis cha or Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 14, God here is mentioned as himself as not a sentence fragment, but a fill in the blank. What do you need? As you're looking at your life and you're thinking about God right now, what do you need? Because that's what he is. Notice this. Today, as we look at God uh, in the Bible, we're going to study him from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15 and verse number 21. And we're going to look at him as a planner. We could look at him as a father. We could look at him as a shield or a buckler. But let's look at him today as the planner. When you and I start in Genesis chapter number 3, verses 1 through 15, we find a very interesting uh, dilemma that's found in Genesis 3. We, we look at that and we automatically know the, that word and those numbers and we say, all right, this is where sin is introduced. It is 
And as we normally look at that, we, we start to maybe assign where blame should go and say, well, it was Adam's fault, or well, it was Eve's fault, or, or well, it was Satan's fault. And we look at that particular account, and we, we try to break down the side of Adam. We try to break down the side of Eve. We try to see why the, the serpent would do such things. And many times, as we look at Genesis chapter 3, the side that we miss is God. We look at everyone who's involved, really, with the exception of God. Notice what happens. Now, we're going to have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 in order to pick up Genesis chapter 3. So God says, let there be light. There is. He says, let all these things happen, day 1 through 6, and all the creation happens. Now, we're up to speed, right? Shake your head this way. All right. Hey, are y'all awake today? Okay. You look like you weren't. When you and I pick up to speed with Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and we see God is the creator and sustainer of all of those things, when it gets to Genesis chapter 3 and they're hanging out around that tree, who provided that? Who provided the fruit from that tree? Who provided the law in that, uh, in that particular chapter? Well, the law is provided by God. The fruit's provided by God. The, the, uh, the garden there is provided by God. The life of Adam and Eve provided there by God. So it makes us wonder when we look at that particular chapter, why did they listen to that serpent so intently? If God so far has provided every single thing for them, he's not skipped a beat, why did they, why did they listen so intently to him? I don't think it was because of any kind of authority. Yeah, I think it was because they liked what he was saying. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You can become like God. And so in Genesis chapter 3, we see the very downfall of man due to a sinful choice. Let's look at first here in the garden. God provides for Adam and Eve. He provides the physical for them. He provides them a house. A house, a, a garden. What if uh, your parent, your, your father, provided for you in, your, in the very outset of your marriage a hundred acre garden area that was, the, the, the grass was just like carpet. All of the trees were already there and producing and all you had to do was just go and live on that land. Would that be all right? Yeah. Well, I don't know how many acres we're looking at with the Garden of Eden. But it provides every single thing that man would ever need. He gives him every single advantage to live on this side of eternity to include the tree of life. The ability to live with him forever. You'll recall toward the end of chapter 3 that tree's taken out of there. But now... Right now, in, the, in this physical state, Adam and Eve have access to it. They have a great garden set in front of them, and they have a job. God not only provides them a house, He provides them a job. Imagine that. What, do you, what, what job would you like to have? I need you to take care of the garden. Just keep it going as it normally would. Okay, that sounds like an easy job. And it wasn't until he provided a house and a job that he then provided marriage. Imagine that. We could spend a lot of time right there, but imagine how those things fall. He provided a marriage for them. Why? He would say in Genesis chapter 2, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make for him a helpmeet, verses 18 through 25. And so he does. He provided for the physical needs of both Adam and Eve. And he never skipped a moment or changed an idea, but he always provided for them physically. Notice this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 and verse number 11. You remember where she is standing there underneath that tree and she said, we can eat of any tree of the garden with the exception of this one. God said, don't eat it, don't touch it, lest you die. And in verse 11, God comes over and says, what have you done? 
On a spiritual aspect of this particular place, God provides for them a law. He says, Here, here's the whole directive of mankind as you live in this paradise garden. Here's the whole thing. Are you ready? Don't mess with that tree. Everything else, or rather nothing else, is off limits. Everything else is underneath your control. Just don't mess with the tree. And why is it? For us as people, uh, we look at Eve at times and we say, I can't believe she did that. But why is it uh, for us as people, when God says, don't do that, that's the only thing that we focus on? Yeah, that's where she is. Here's this tree. It must be great. You know, I have a theory that the tree was a grapefruit tree. Have you ever tasted a grapefruit? That's a gross thing. That's a gross thing. He gave them a law. With, with no exception to say, well, Adam, you can touch it and you can eat of it, but Eve, you can't. Imagine if that was the exception how unfair that would be toward Eve. That Adam can deal with this and, and she cannot. No, the, the rule was nobody. Just, just don't mess with it. And within the process of time, and within the decision-making skills of both Adam and Eve, they both took that fruit, they both ate of that fruit, and, pay attention right here, you ready? They both broke the law. Both of them. Well, whose fault was it that Adam ate that fruit? You ready? Write this down, you ready? It was Adam's. And whose fault is it that Eve ate that fruit? It's, it's Eve's. It doesn't matter who you want to blame it on. It doesn't matter if Adam wants to blame it on Eve. It doesn't matter if Eve wants to blame it on Satan. It's Adam's fault that Adam ate it. It's Eve's fault that Eve ate it. And because there is a law broken, there must be amends made. And how does that happen? Hmm. Well, if... The transgression of the law provides death for the transgressor. Well then, within one fell swoop, humanity should be wiped out. Hmm. Let's see if we can go a little further. Notice this with God. With God, the, the following after the rule, the following after the law, means mankind can be righteous. Following after what he says, being right. That's the root word of righteous, right. And so, that's what man wants. But man here wants to be rebellious. So if a law is broken, a spiritual law is broken, and the physical is given to them, what's going to happen to them eternally? Let's look at verse number 21 and verse number 15 first. They're going to need some clothes. Well, we tied these fig leaves together and put them on us. We thought that would cover us up. It's not going to cover you up. First of all, God would say to them, who told you you were naked? And then right behind that is, did you eat that fruit? Now, as God asks all of those questions we see in Genesis chapter 3, he already knew all the answers to them. He already had all of the information. So why is he asking those questions? Sometimes. Sometimes it helps people to say those things out loud to understand how bad it is. It's just a fruit, right? Ladies and gentlemen, if you write down things, write this down. And commit this to memory and keep it for as long as you live and teach it to everyone you see in regards to 
Genesis chapter 3. Are you ready? It was never, ever about that fruit. It was never about that. It was always about, will you do what I say? That's Genesis chapter 3. It has always been about that. They need some clothes. Why? Because they found out they were naked. Sure. They tried. They tried what they could. They, they, they thought they may have covered it okay. And God say, you, you didn't. Interestingly, in verse 21 and following, you'll find out that God made them clothes that fit from, from their shoulders all the way to their knees. Interesting idea. He's going to cover up all of those bits and pieces that we so much want to uncover even today. And secondly, and most importantly, uh, other than clothes, what they need here is a Savior. Why? Go back to the idea of the uh, spiritual that God provides for them. When they have to make amends, what are they going to do? And I think as he makes these clothes and he provides uh, the coming Savior for them, I think he makes amends for them there. Let me ask you a question. Were their clothes made out of animal skins? Shake your head this way. Mm-hmm. Does God have the ability to produce animal skins out of thin air? Absolutely. How do you think he got those skins? It's going to be a sacrifice made for the sin that was committed in that garden. But it's not going to be enough. That sacrifice that's found in the garden there is not going to be enough. Will it be enough for Adam and Eve and this sin? All right, we're going to take a poll. And I had to start doing this in the teenage class so that everybody would take the poll with me. If you want to close your eyes, that's fine. So nobody will see what you're, what you're voting. Does the sacrifice that's made in the garden cover the sin in the garden? Hmm. Hebrews 10, verse 4, For it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sin of man. But in Genesis chapter 3, and verse number 15, God promises something to this couple. What does He promise to them? He has this weird, veiled promise. Look over there in chapter 3. This, this promise that, that seemingly doesn't make sense until you and I begin to really explore it and look at it. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, the idea here is what the um, academic world would call the proto-evangelic. That's a great word, isn't it? You know what it means? First time Jesus is mentioned within the Bible. First time Jesus is mentioned, God automatically takes out half of the human race because it says he, that takes out all of the she. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be some sort of enemy whose head's going to be crushed and someone whose heel's going to be hurt. And I wonder if after every child that Eve had, I wonder if she held this baby in her hands and looked at this precious gift from God and said, is this the one? Will he be the one that God told us about? Will he be the one who takes away the sin of the world? Or will we wait for someone else? But as the book of Genesis unfolds, you see God's plan unfolding. You see it in, in Genesis chapter number 12 as he tells uh, Abraham, 
about his family saving the world. You see it in Genesis chapter 49 where he speaks of the tribe of Judah. You continue through the Old Testament, you see it and you see it and you see those things unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And as God the planner shows himself to be exactly that throughout the Old Testament, you begin to see how much that God loves us. How much he plans for us, how much he has taken everything into consideration. So you ask the question, what does this have to do with me? Everything. It has absolutely everything to do with you. Well, I don't live in that garden and I don't have that particular choice. No, you don't live in that garden. And you don't have that choice of that tree. But do you not make choices that affect your eternity every day? By the way, not choosing is also a choice. We can't stand here and be spiritually Switzerland. We have to make that choice. Everything that the, that the Bible would reveal about God, how he has provided for both Adam and Eve in that garden, he has provided the same for me. Does he provide for me physically? Shake your head this way. Oh, yeah. Does he provide a law for me? Yes. Will he provide for me eternally? Oh, don't be so quick to shake your head. Because will he provide for me eternally has one big if right there with it. Has a gigantic if right there. God will provide for me physically and spiritually on this side of eternity, and he will provide for me eternally if... If I'm faithful to him here, he will provide those good things for me eternally if I'm faithful to him here. That is, if I have been obedient unto his gospel and if I have lived faithfully to those things, God will provide eternally for me. You might, you might say, preacher, how do I do that? Well, it's a great question. Uh, it's not enough to hear what God has to say, even, even though that's part of it. And it's not enough to uh, repent of your sin, Luke 13, 3. It's not enough to confess that Jesus is the Christ, Matthew 10, 32. It's not even enough to be baptized, Mark 16 and verse 16. That's, it's not enough just to do those things. Matter of fact, it's not enough to do just any one of those things. But if you do all of those things together... Hearing him, believing those things, repenting of your sin, confessing that Jesus is the Christ and being baptized in water, you have accessed God's plan of salvation. You have become part of his family. He takes your needs upon him. He does have a hard requirement. The hard requirement God has is this. When, when you decide to become his child and be baptized for the remission of your sins, completing all of those other things before, you make a vow to him. You make a, a promise to him. You make a, 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 an eternal vow to him. And that vow is that you will be his servant throughout this life and into eternity. And that's the hard part. And see, the hard part of that is this. Every day when I wake up, I still get to choose what I'm going to do today. So yesterday I may have chosen to be his servant. Well, what if I don't choose that today? The hard part is me. Will you follow the things that you have already promised God? Or is it, is it, is it not that serious? Well, where are you? If he provides for you physically and spiritually, and he would love to provide for you eternally, would you make the choice to be his? Or 
Do you want to stay right where you are? Right in your comfortable lane? And at some point in time, believe the lie you're trying to tell yourself that everything's going to be okay. It's literally up to you. Adam and Eve had a choice. Rather than you stand on the same cusp with them, you have the same choice. Would you be obedient to whatever God's commands are? Or would you choose self? Now, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song to encourage anyone who would like to put on Christ in baptism. We're going to stand and sing a song for anyone who may have not been living the way they should, who wants to come back home to the Father. That'd be great. But as we stand and sing this song, who's that? That's, that's Clayton's going to lead that song. As we stand and sing this song here, just in a moment, here's what I need you to think about. What will your choice be eternally? And make that choice now while we stand and while we sing.